and welcome to a brand new series of Animal Park. I'm Kate Humble. And I'm Ben Fogel and it's a momentous year here at Longleat as the Safari Park is celebrating its 40th anniversary. We'll be getting close up, not just to the giraffes, but to the 40 other species of animal who live here. Telling stories from all parts of the estate, both on land and on water. And of course, we'll be meeting Lord Bath and exploring his magnificent house and its extraordinary contents. Here's what's coming up on today's programme. A life and death drama when things go very wrong for Imogen the pregnant giraffe. If the giraffe survived, it would be a miracle. There's monkey mischief afoot after we hide their breakfast. That's brilliant, that one sliding down the pole. They are just fantastic to watch, aren't they? And the vet may soon have to face a difficult decision about Babs, the elderly rhino. Well, Babs is looking her age, actually. She's not looking great at all. But first, we're going up to lion country, where there's been a dramatic development. Last year, new blood arrived at Longleat, Kabir, the Barbary lion. He was brought from Port Lim Wild Animal Park in Kent to try to establish a new pride. The hope was that this would, in time, become a real family with cubs to raise. Kabir's intended mates were a couple of young sisters, Luna and Yendi. They settled down straight away, and it seemed to be a match made in heaven. In fact, encouraging behaviour was soon spotted. But would it lead to anything? We just had to wait and see. Now, keeper Brian Kent has some wonderful news. We've got a lion cub born, so it's really exciting, because it's Kabir's. There's a new lion here, and he's been here, what, seven months, so he's produced some goods. The new cub is a little girl. She's Yendi's first baby, and that's a worry, because sometimes new lion mothers don't seem to know how to look after their young. But so far, Yendi has been doing all the right things. Basically, you know, just caring for us and licking her, making sure she's clean. The cub's now seven weeks old, so she's still on milk, and also starting to eat food as well. So she's doing well. And hopefully her sister, who's in the other side, she's due as well for some cubs. I thought she was going to have them last week, but no such luck. So it's just a matter of waiting at the moment. While her sister Yendi had one cub, Luna is looking large. They think she may be carrying more. Lions usually have between two and four at a time. But lions are secretive and only have their cubs when they're alone, usually the middle of the night. It's a rare event that's almost never been seen, so we've called in Andy Milk. He's a specialist cameraman who's had a lot of experience finding ways to film the unfilmable. We're hoping he'll help us to witness the miracle of birth for the very first time. Well, I've just fitted the brackets up and uh, got all that ready. Um, just now doing the final connection. And hopefully, it's in the right place. We're not going to be obscured by the wire on the cage. What we've done is we've installed everything outside and there's actually nothing in the cage at all, so the lion can't get to it, can't touch anything. And it's all quite safe. The spy camera works like a CCTV system, so it won't disturb Luna at all. And it can get pictures in complete darkness by using infrared lamps. Infrared is just basically light of a different wavelength um, to what the human eye can respond to. Um, I don't think a lion will see it, although they're not actually that concerned about light at all, so it wouldn't matter. Um, but if we were to come in at night, the picture on here would be fine but we wouldn't be able to see anything in the cage itself. The system can record continuously for up to 10 hours, so as night approaches, it's turned on. We'll be back later to find out if our spy camera really can capture these precious moments, the very first minutes of life. The Lion House isn't the only place that's been blessed with new arrivals. There are a number of others elsewhere at Longleat. 
but not all of them have been born here. Some have come from other parks and zoos. I'm here in Pet's Corner with Head of Section Darren Beasley, who set me a task to try and find his latest addition to the area. Darren, how on earth am I supposed to find us? Um, well, I'm going to give you a clue. We're heading in the right direction, and okay. it's a, a freezing cold day today, and this yeah. animal likes it warm. OK. Um, and so in, presumably it's somewhere around here. It's not as easy as that, though. There's oh, a, not? a lovely warm verb. There's basking spots of, of 95, nearly 100 degrees in there in places. OK. Can you see it? No. Is it...? Um... I'll tell you what, I'll, give, here, I'll come around and actually look through the door. Let's okay. see if we can... Here, look at this. Can you see it? Yeah. Feel the heat there. Feel yeah, the, I really more. can. It's one of my favourite animals. Am I, am I still very cold over here? Yeah, you've got to sort of lean in, have a little look. It's not venomous, you're OK. Say, it's obviously on. very small, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I can't see anything. Down. There you are, Ben. Have a little look under here. They're in these rocks. Yep. This animal loves... It's got a special defence. Yep. It wedges itself in rocks. Okay. So look in this sort of area Can I move, here. Should I move Just the go, rocks go very gently, Ben, yeah. Very gently. Are you sure it's, it doesn't bite or smell? No, you're fine. What do we have Can you see that? Here? Can I you see? Can. Oh, oh, look. I promise I haven't hid that in there. That it's is really a, there. That's, yep. that's where it was. You can gently pick him up. Why don't you do it, just so I don't... OK. So ben, presumably we have a, a tortoise here. This is Poppadom. Poppadom. And he's a pancake tortoise. Look at We're that. Really flat, much flatter than sort of the conventional tortoise, yeah. I suppose. Basically, um, they, they've, they've found a little niche in life, and that is to defend themselves. Obviously, tortoises have a dome which they, they soak up the sunshine. These guys, they've, they've developed to be very, very flat. And what they do is that one was doing then, as he was doing there, they wedge themselves in tiny little cracks right. and, and crevices in rocky outcrops in Africa. Yes. And then the big birds of prey and the jackals and things, they have great difficulty getting them out. And they obviously have this amazing colour. If we just put him down next to... You can see he practically blends it. He, he could almost be a, a rock there already. So what would predate them out in the wild in uh, Africa? Um, most of the carnivores, I mean, I'm afraid they are pretty much bottom of the food chain. Right. These guys will eat vegetation, they eat the grasses and things. Um, but unlike our, our normal our Mediterranean tortoises and tortoises we know with big dome shells, yes. these have got spaces in between their, their, their bones and their ligaments. So they're actually very gentle. They're very, uh, very gentle, very, very soft to touch, yes. if you like. Can I, can I so, so, yeah, uh, have a quick hold you there? You feel, feel that. And it's actually, oh, it's, it does feel... It's, it's almost, especially on the under, especially yeah. under here, it's very soft, isn't it? And then the best thing is, if they think there's a danger, they run really fast. Like, honestly, that is one of the fastest land tortoises anywhere in the world. <laughs> I, know like I never think of a tortoise going fast. We see how fast he might, he might move now. Maybe to get away from us. Look at him go. No, he's not actually sprinting. But when, when they find themselves a, a nice wedge or a, a nice, nice crevice, they go head first in. And they used to, people used to think they'd swell their bodies to stop them being pulled out. But what they do, if I just, sorry, because he's racing off, he's trying to find a wedge. <laughs> these, these legs are actually they're like anchors. And they'll turn them, twist them. Yes. And they, 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 they literally catch. So to you, anchor them into so the So you spot. can't pull them out. I'm hoping now, in here, he'll soon be joined by some more. We'll get a I was going to say, are you going to try and find him a, yeah, he a is, girlfriend? He is a little boy, so we're going to get him a couple of girlfriends. He's a lucky lad. Um, and hopefully they'll learn uh, as well that we give him lots of looks and crannies to hide in, and he should just perform his, hopefully, his natural behaviour. He's going straight back I, I, where I we pulled him out. I, I, think, I think we should leave him to it, shall we? Brilliant. Yes, Darren, please. thank you very much. Thank you. When babies arrive, it's not always good news, because sometimes the miracle of birth can go horribly wrong. Recently, the giraffe house was the scene of dramatic events, a life and death struggle that no one who was there will ever forget. Imogen is 10 years old. Everyone was pleased for her because after several years of trying, she finally managed to carry a baby to term. With giraffes, that's 15 months. When it looked like her time had come, one of the first there was senior warden Bev Evans. It's really exciting when we came in and she's actually um, starting to go into labour, but obviously with that came the com complications, so um, from like really exciting to uh, really worrying in, in quite a short space of time, actually. When Imogen's labour went on for over a day, it was clear to Andy Hayton, the keeper in charge of the giraffes, that something was wrong. Sunday morning, Yvette came out, looked at her, um, and the decision was kind of taken. We would probably have to pull the calf. The calf was obviously badly presented. We, we thought possibly it could have been a breech birth, or the head was tilted back, so she just couldn't physically push out. Pulling the calf out by hand would be the only way to help. But to do that, Imogen would have to be sedated with an anaesthetic. 
And that's always a risky business, as vet Duncan Williams knows. Anesthetic-wise, I think giraffes probably are the most dangerous, really. Literature reports are basically one in three anesthetics with giraffes ended in fatal fatalities. But if they didn't do something, Imogen and the baby would certainly die. Nevertheless, Deputy Head Warden Ian Turner didn't like the odds. The last thing you want to do is knock out a giraffe. And even worse is knock out a giraffe what's got a baby inside. So, you know, it was a last resort. We hadn't got any choice in the matter. We'd waited till the last minute and, you know, it was just fingers crossed from now on. Now, a whole team of vets and staff has been urgently summoned to help. Nothing like this has ever been done here before, and Ian is concerned to record every detail. So he and his keepers are going to film whatever happens. The anaesthetic is administered using a syringe on the end of a pole. Andy's dreading what will happen next. When they go, sometimes what they'll do is they'll force themselves into a corner and they'll try and prop themselves up and then what can happen is they'll actually flip themselves straight back over where they just can't fight anymore and they're just out on their feet almost and they just collapse. The big worry for us is if she goes over straight backwards she could break her spine. Um, the box is all lined out with large bales of hay to, to soften it as much as we can do. The straw on the floor has also been piled up to cushion the impact. The next minutes will be critical and we'll be back very soon to find out if Imogen and her baby survive. Longleat is home to a troop of over 80 rhesus macaque monkeys. The species is found all across Asia, from the tropics right up to the chilly foothills of the Himalayas. So they're quite happy to live outside in Wiltshire all year round, just as long as they've got something to keep them occupied and plenty to eat. I'm up at Monkey Jungle with keeper Kevin Nibbs, and um, we're trying a bit of an experiment, I gather, this morning, Kev. Absolutely, yep. Yeah. We've cut this one with the dry food. Yeah, no, I was looking at this because don't you usually feed them fruit and vegetables and things? Uh, yeah, we, they get the fruit and veg in the afternoons. Right. Um, we feed this in the mornings, which mm -hmm. is like, we've got primate pellets here. OK. Um, it's pretty much just like Weetabex muesli that we have in the mornings. Um, OK. And it gets them going for the rest of the day. And it's, is it full of sort of the right kind of vitamins and things that absolutely, they need? Yeah, absolutely. So the, these primate pellets are specially made for primates, so they're, right. they're perfect. Okay. And we've got a little bit of whole maize there, which is, you know, it's just a good filler, something to go in their bellies, and dog biscuits as well, which is good for their teeth. Wow, OK. So, um, what's the experiment? Well, the plan is, uh, we've noticed a lot of birds around sort of mm -hmm. this time of year, yeah. and they, they tend to come down and steal all the monkey's food, so we're feeding twice as much food as what we need to. Right. Um, now, this winter has been particularly cold. We've moved the buffalo out of the jungle, yeah. where they need a bit more shelter. Yeah. Um, we've got a, a nice big spare shelter here So now. this is where the buffalo usually That's hang out when they want shelter? Exactly, yeah. So what we've done, we've put a load of straw in here, and yeah. what we want to do is put the food in the straw, in the bedding, kick some fresh straw over the top and then let the monkeys come in. Oh, right, so they themselves. can forage for it. Absolutely. Brilliant Perfect idea. natural behaviour. So shall I just sort of, what, put handfuls First, yep, out? Just throw just it anywhere you want in here. Just throw it around in the yep. straw. All right, like this. Yep, that's it. And we'll just come over afterwards and kick some fresh straw over the top so it's hidden. OK. So we can literally, I mean, I suppose hiding it quite well is... is better for the monkeys, makes them work harder exactly. for it. Exactly, it's very good enrichment for them and it, it, it's like a, a natural behaviour. In the wild they'd, they'd forage through leaf mould and leaf litter, yeah. looking for bugs and bits of fruit and veg. And, and this is just recreating that really. Okay. Lucky monkeys. And obviously that'll maybe help keep them warm as well Absolutely, in this weather. Absolutely, yeah. They can have a good play in the straw. Right. Well, we're nearly done here. Um, we'll get out of the way. We kick that over there like that. Yeah. Um, and join us later to see if the monkeys like their new experiment. Back in the giraffe house, vet Duncan Williams and the team have just given Imogen an injection of anaesthetic. The trouble is, with giraffes, the anaesthetic itself can be the most dangerous thing. I think the big problem is, you know, the massive animal. The, when they fall down, you've got the risk of regurgitation. Maybe the stomach contents, the rumen contents can go up 
the, the esophagus and get swallowed into the lungs. So, as quickly as possible, an air tube needed to be inserted all the way down that long throat to the top of the lungs. That's the most important thing to do. Um, that didn't quite go according to plan. Um, literally, just as we were getting the tube down, she regurgitated, but look at the tube was just down in time. One of the four vets on the team is an anaesthetist from Bristol University's veterinary school, Pamela Morrison. She's responsible for the air tube and life support. They're so big. <laughs> I'm used to anaesthetizing large animals, but they're very long and um, with long legs, long necks. And you know on the back of your mind all the time that it is such a risky procedure. With Imogen anaesthetized, Duncan can start his examination. He needs to find out what state the calf is in and how it's lying just by feel. The ropes are essential for everyone's safety, and it takes a lot of hands to hold them secure. Ian's called in staff from all over the safari park to help. You know, there's 30 odd people round and she had draft kicks. Somebody's going to end up either seriously injured or uh, even worse. I mean, if they kicked a line, for instance, it'd be dead. I mean, I've actually been trampled on by a giraffe, um, and it's not really pleasant. And they've got really big hoofs. You know, you've got that big swing from a distance. And they don't know they're doing it, so it's not something to do on purpose. But you imagine a leg going like that back, and you're just in the wrong place, and it sends you flying. Not recommended. Duncan's internal examination has revealed some sad news. The calf inside is already dead. It may have been dead for some time. Senior warden Bev Evans had been looking forward to having a new baby in the giraffe house. It was quite sad to lose the calf. The vets and everybody couldn't do anything about that. You kind of, you know, it, it, we couldn't have done anything, so there's no point worrying too much about that. But yeah, it's, it's such a shame that we lost. We lost him, his little boy. Now all their efforts are concentrated just on trying to save Imogen. They have to get the dead calf out, but there's been a complication. Unfortunately, the drug that we gave her to relax the uterus has actually made her body think that she stopped being in labour. So what she, she's actually closing her cervix down. So a cervix that's capable of holding in a baby giraffe is obviously quite a strong muscle. So that's closed down. And what we're trying to do is pull something this big out of something that big, which just isn't happening. I mean, you can see the amount of effort that the guys are putting in trying to pull the calf. There was no way that it was going to come out just simply because everything had closed down again. I mean, we, we did a, quite a major pull on it, and, and it just wasn't shifting, unfortunately. Duncan and the team must come up with a new plan, and fast, because now Imogen's life is balanced on a knife edge. I'm back up at Monkey Jungle with keeper Kevin Nibbs. Um, earlier, we spread food out, hidden in the straw in that shelter. The monkeys are just starting to come around, Kev. Um, they've obviously... What, do, do you think they knew what we were up to? Or do they smell it? How do you think they get the, the hint that there's food around? Uh, they're very curious as a species anyway, so anything we do, they're, they're always there straight away. Um, and as soon as they find food, they're going to start making little, little noises to each other, communicating that they found some food. and. That'll make so the rest all the rest in. of the troop, because there are, there are monkeys that are sort of scattered around in the in the dead wood up there, and they are beginning to head over this way. Yeah, so they, they are coming. They pick up these these signals. Oh, there's food it, yeah. over here. Is that that's yeah, what yeah, happens? Absolutely. This, yeah. this is great. This is perfect natural behaviour. And this big guy at the front here, is, that's Timmy. He's our, our dominant male, so he's there straight away. Right. Um, as he would be in the wild. Now, obviously, that food, we buried it quite well, and, and yeah. the little maize pellets, for example, are tiny. How are they finding it? Are they using smell, or...? 
Sight or everything? Mostly it will be sight. Um, right. They'll dig through it with their hands. If they see something they think they can eat, they'll put it straight into the mouth like, like a little child would, give it a bite, and if they can eat it, great. If they can't, they'll just throw it away and oh, off really? they go again. <laughs> um, they, they sniff things quite well as well. They've got a very good sense of smell. And what they do now, they're just going to fill up the cheek pouches, stuff as, as much as they can. They get big old, bigger cheeks on them, <laughs> and off they go. Well, it's really, it's, look, they're all coming in now, aren't they? It's amazing to see them. And it's, it, it, as you say, I mean, this is a new way of feeding them, but it, it looks entirely natural to them. Absolutely, and the best thing is there's no birds stealing the food, no. so they get it all to themselves. <laughs> that's brilliant, that one sliding down the pole. They are just fantastic to watch, aren't they? <laughs> They've blown it. I was going to say, I'm quite surprised how calm they all are. There's no sort of fighting. Presumably, that's because there's enough to go round. Yeah, definitely, yeah. And they all know their role as well. Um, occasionally, you get a, a very brave little one come in and try and steal some food and that's not acceptable really in monkey monkey society and they get told very quickly it's not acceptable. But it is amazing I mean, if you just saw that scene it would be very difficult to tell which one is dominant I mean, you've got some very small ones in there and and it seems to be that they've got it quite well worked out the society quite well worked out. Exactly yeah yeah the, the males are the, are the big dominant ones and then the females come after that and, and normally that the females sort of rule it really, they're very clever. Are and they? They, they make sure that nothing happens and the males just kind of lay back and, and do their bit. <laughs> now when you get a, a sort of squeak like that, is that a sort of warning? Just just be careful. Oh, oh look, no, look, this is Timmy at the front here. Uh, no, this, this one's called Maggie. Oh, Ma uh, This is a female and she, she's always on the lookout for, for people and she always likes to make faces at people. It, this is a, actually a threat. So she's actually pulling a face at our camera man at this moment? Yeah, yeah, because we're looking at her, she doesn't like it and she's, she's threatening us really to sort of stay away from the food. I mean, do you, do you think now this might be um, something you repeat? Do you think this has been a successful experiment? Definitely, yeah. I'd like to do this every day if I can. Yeah. Every morning we'll, we'll do this until they get bored of it. And if they do get bored of it, we'll, we'll have to think something else. Come up with another idea. Definitely. Well, Kev, thank you very, very no much. Worries. It's, it's <laughs> just a fantastic sight. Monkeys everywhere. With Imogen's baby not only dead, but also hopelessly stuck, there's only one way left to try to save her life. Despite the fact that her senior keeper, Andy Hayton, knows there's little chance of success. We're going to attempt a caesarean just to give her a go. You know, we can't just decide we're going to put her down and, and, and quit here, you know. We've got to, let's say, it's, if it, if, even if it doesn't come out the right decision or the right outcome that we want, we've got to at least try it. So we're going to attempt a caesarean now and, and see how we go. This will be the first caesarean that's ever been performed on a giraffe at Longleat. Duncan Williams is the vet in charge of the team. We do caesareans in cattle all the time, and the actual operation itself is, is very much similar to, to, to doing it in a cow. But, I mean, it is different. This was lying, she was lying down, cows are normally standing up, and um, we don't normally have quite so many people helping. <laughs> I've never done anything as, like that in a draft at all. No. Imogen has now been under anaesthetic for over two hours. For a giraffe, that's a dangerously long time. It's up to Pam Morrison, the veterinary anaesthetist, to monitor her condition. We were monitoring her blood pressure, making sure that that was within normal range, not too high, not too low. Also trying to make sure that she's adequately anaesthetised so that she is not either very, very deeply anaesthetised, which is going to cause problems for her organs and reduce the amount of blood getting to them, or very, very lightly anaesthetised and liable to move or be aware of what's going on. Meanwhile, the other three vets are desperately trying to get the dead calf out. Even Deputy Head Warden Ian Turner is losing hope. She never seen a serenade on a giraffe. And literally, if the giraffe survived, it would be a miracle. Here it comes. Get towards me, towards me. Go on. He should come down. Right, Paul, that's fine, Paul. That's fine. You're coming out there. You've just took a baby draft out of a, of a stomach, which is, as you know, is, is a six foot odd baby. So that's removed. So the actual wound, you know, the stitches were talking like that sort of size stitching. Uh, and she's got two lots of internal stitching plus the external stitching. She's now been under for four hours plus, um, which is obviously, you know, you want to keep it to the minimum time. And she's now had all this operation going on 
you know, is going through her. You know, it's going to be touch and go where she actually survives this operation anyhow. But to go through that time and all this, you know, she's been prodded around, poked, stitches here and the rigmarole that's gone on, it's, uh, you know, it's quite a traumatic uh, time for her. The stitches need to be made very strong because giraffes must always stand up, even when they've got such a massive wound. The moment of truth will come when the job is finished and they try to revive Imogen. The question is, will she ever wake up again? I'm down in Pet's Corner with Keeper Bev Allen and two very sweet little guinea pigs. Okay. They're obviously um, young. How old are they? Uh, they're about nine weeks old now. Um, two females. OK. And, and this is Tia and that's Maria. <laughs> I like those names. <laughs> do guinea pigs of this age take a lot of care? Um, they do. You've got to make sure um, that you feed them the correct diet, lots of hay in, in, their, mm -hmm. in their diet. Um, also um, a dry mix as well and lots of fruit we give ours as well. And they're obviously very popular um, pets with children. Uh, would you recommend them? Um, for younger children, I, rec I recommend guinea pigs because um, they're good fun. And also long hairs, you've got to make sure you groom them quite often as well. Do you actually yeah. have to run a, a brush, a comb through their hair? We do, yeah, and haircuts as well now and then. <laughs> wow. <laughs> They are very sweet, aren't they? They are. <laughs> and how, how long would they live for? Um, about four to five years average. OK. Well, Bev, thank you very much. And don't go away, because here's what's still to come on today's programme. We'll find out whether or not Imogen survives. Can the meerkats work out how to make an omelette? And then up in the great house, Ben and I take on a challenge to see if we can become Longleat Guides in just one day. I would like to welcome you into the breakfast room. Please come along, everyone. But now we're going back to the Lion House, where we've set up a spy camera to try to capture a secret and rarely seen event, the moment when a lioness gives birth. But Luna, the lioness in question, is keeping everyone on tenderhooks. Here are our cubs. Keeper Brian Kent has been expecting to find new cubs every morning for the last week. She does look really big now, so, you know, she's going to have them soon. You know, it's just a matter of waiting. Four days later, in the dead of night, it finally happened. Our spy camera was able to get this unique footage. Two cubs are out, and here's the third. Immediately, Luna starts to clean the baby. In all the years they've been looking after the lions, this is the first time Brian Kent and Bob Trollope have ever witnessed these precious moments. The time limit was getting on a bit. It was uh, every time we could say, no, it'd be next week. Never happened. Um, you know, nature takes its course and eventually out they come, so it was great. It was good to see them. Well, and to see what I've seen on here now, which is nice. All the years I worked here, not to be able to see something like close up. It's great. Oh, it's good, it's good detail as well, isn't it? Now, in daylight, the camera can get better quality pictures of the cub's first few hours. And it's revealing more natural behaviour that would normally be impossible to observe. For example, when Brian and Bob first went into the lion house this morning, Luna was acting quite differently. She was very protective of them. As soon as we walked in, you, you knew that she'd had them because apart from the, the sort of noises they were making, she was up at the front of the cage trying to see us off. And I think when we went in, first of all, you couldn't quite see how many there was because she was obviously up there trying to protect them. We didn't want to spend an awful lot of time in there. It's best just to keep away. As long as you've checked them twice a day, you don't really need to stay there all day. There's just no need, you know, because you can make things worse. It's just better to stay away, let her get on with it. You know? It's amazing to see, because quite often when we go in there and find the cubs there, you know, that they've, they're either being cleaned or they've just been born. Um, but to actually see them, well, how quick it is that they go to the nipple and really quick it is between each cub. That's how born. strong they are, isn't it? Yeah, you know, amazing. You see yeah, them out around isn't it? straight away. You know, that's really great to see. 
Luna's babies are very vulnerable. Each weighs little more than a kilo, and at this stage, they're still blind. In the wild, only one in five cubs make it to adulthood, and even in captivity, the future of these little ones is far from certain. You, you know, you can lose cubs. Like when mum may sit on them by accident, you know, it can happen. So you just got to wait and hope things go well. You know, you, you can't do nothing about it. That's, you know, that's how it goes. And uh, hopefully, you know, you should do fine. We'll see how it goes. And of course, we'll be following developments in the Lion House closely. Later in the series, we'll be back to find out what happens to the newborn cubs. As Kate saw earlier with the monkeys, the keepers all across Longleat are constantly trying to find ways to make life more interesting for the residents. It's called enrichment, and the idea is to encourage the animals' natural behaviour and to stimulate their senses. I'm down at Meerkat Mound with keeper Val McGruther, and we're about to feed them, but this isn't a normal feed. Is that right, Val? Yes, that's right. Um, because meerkats, they'll eat all sorts of things, especially in the wild, it'll be invertebrates a lot of the time. Maybe scorpions, they bite the sting off the tail, small snakes. Um, but they also eat eggs. Okay. Now, we're having a bit of an experiment here. <laughs> oh, very good, <laughs> I like that. Because <laughs> we've got two unboiled eggs yes. and we've got one hard-boiled egg. So okay. we're just going to have a little look, see which one they break into first, see if it does make a difference or whether they like them all the same, really. Okay, so we should, now I've, I've noticed that the... Um, Yellow mongoose. The mongoose yeah. house, exactly. Yeah. And they obviously all get along together. Yes, they do. They, they, they get on very well. In the evening, when we give them the main feed, yep. we actually do separate them for okay. feeding, um, just for safety purposes, really. Right, where, where should we do this experiment, right. then? Right, if we put them a bit near a rock... Yep. ..because what they do, they'll sort of roll the eggs along and uh, perhaps... Try and, yes, you can. So the, these are the two. These are the two. Um, just normal. They, these yes, are these right, are normal yes, legs. Where yeah. should I pop them? If you tell me. Yeah, that's it. That's over fine. Here. Yeah. And then this the is the hard. Down. That's the hard boiled one. Should I pop it just over there? Do you yeah. Think? And well, hopefully gonna... we've got to try and attract them over. I'll throw a few mealworms. Oh, is that the, right? that's, that's the way to a, a <laughs> meerkat's horse, is yes, it? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So Come on. Then. Meerkats. Yeah. So you've got the three meerkats here now, don't you? Yes, we do. Yeah, we've got uh, one male and two females. Right. So it would be really nice if we had the putter of tiny feet. That would be great. And do you know, Fingers have you crossed. any idea which one is likely to come over for the eggs first? It could actually be any of them. Right. Um, and presumably yeah. in the wild, they would find the eggs from nesting birds or...? That's right, yes. Any sort of ground nesting bird that they, they would go for, the right sort of size. Oh, well, look, here we oh, go. Here we go. Go on then, have a go. Having a little feel of it. So that's, that's the hard, hard, that's the hard one, boiled yeah. one. Go on then, have a dig at it. Well, it, it seems to be kind of digging at the ground as well around yeah. us. Yeah, well, they, they will dig around things um, when there's this sort of an instinct to them to dig around anyway, but um, they could dig around looking for a stone or perhaps um, just rolling against something hard. So this is sort of proving that they still have some of their natural instincts. Oh, yes, they do. They have Even quite though, because were these guys actually born in captivity? Yes, they were, yes. And yet they still know exactly, you know, what they should try and do with an egg. Although, having said that, <laughs> this, this one just seems to be um, oh, trying to bury it. They will get into it. No, he's not trying to bury it, but he's trying to get into it. And still perplexed. Yeah. But you, you think that they should actually crack it against the rocks, They should do, do yeah. <laughs> but we, we do give them to them. And they... Oh, look, we've, oh, yeah. we've got... Um, the mongoose was kind yeah. of creeping in oh, there. Here we go. They're coming to this one now. And this is all part of your enrichment, is it, that you, yeah. like to, you like to do here, just to keep them occupied? Yes, it is. It is really good to sort of give them different things. Um, oh, oh, he's got oh, it. Oh, wow. There. Well, that there we go. Well, good, wasn't it? Yeah, we've just worked out that some, the mongoose the definitely knows how to do it. better, aren't they? It's very clever, isn't it, how yeah. they knew how to just crack it. And they're, they're obviously happy sharing the egg there together. They are at the moment. <laughs> Could they at the moment? <laughs> is that because we there's did. enough... Oh, look, that, so the meerkat, look, it's sort of, is, it's it? mine, yeah. get away. Yeah. Actually, generally speaking, the mongoose will be more aggressive mm -hmm. when they've got food th than the meerkats. Look, so we've got the, the other mongoose is yeah. coming up to, um, to try and work on the, the yeah. hard-boiled egg here. So this, this, in theory, should be easier to get into. It should do. Also, um... 
There we go. <laughs> well, there we go. I think we call that a, a thief. <laughs> I think so. A thief in the night. Oh, this one, look. And he's got into it there. So there yeah, we've right got the, the, other, the other yeah. that's got into yeah. it. So would you deem that a success, Val? I think so. I think that was really good. Because both the uh, unboiled ones, they went, they got cracked and eaten. The boiled one, that got whipped away, didn't it? <laughs> That was Fantastic. really good. They got into them, they broke them on the stone just like we thought they were going to, so it was yes. great. Thank you very yeah. much, Val. I think we very have welcome. three rather contented meerkats there. The emergency caesarean to try to save Imogen's life has taken three and a half hours. Her calf was dead inside, and it took all the efforts of four vets and a whole team of keepers to get it out. Now the time has come to try to wake Imogen up and the stress is starting to show. Oh, it feels like we've been doing this for about a week. Yeah, it's been a long day. I mean, we've kind of been stood around. It's the vets and the anaesthetists that have done all the, all the hard work. The caesarean was done, um, unfortunately, dead baby, but we were pretty much sure of that. And surprisingly, for, for two days of the calf being dead, it started to decompose already. So the big worry is if the calf has decomposed so far, that she's infected. Once we'd finished all the operation, um, Duncan had stitched it all back up, he'd got all these stitches done, he cleaned the wound up, he'd give it all the antibiotics and stuff, they give it a uh, revive on. What we do is, um, was Andy, Ryan, and a couple of others stayed in there, and we moved out with just Ryan and Andy in there and sit it on its, what you do is you sit on its neck, you wait for it to come round, and then at the last minute, once it's up, you go off its neck and it sits up. It's an anxious time for Pam, the veterinary anaesthetist. To a certain extent, I think you're relieved that one part has gone well, but still nervous about the part that still has to go. It's not completely finished until she's up standing and well. And for me, particularly, I find that period very nerve wracking because beyond, we've got very little control of how she gets up and she could easily injure herself. They were expecting Imogen to at least try to stand up as soon as she came round. Something is wrong because lying down is unnatural to a giraffe. It's dangerous to their health and can lead them to just give up and lose the will to live. The longer the anaesthetic, the more likely you are to have some of the other problems associated with anaesthesia in large animals. For example, there's pressure on the muscles which have been lying in an awkward position with 600 kilos of giraffe lying on top of certain areas. It's one of these difficult sort of situations is how much do you intervene? Do you let her do it herself? And you always worry that you don't do enough and if something bad happens, you know, you can be blaming yourself. But a few minutes later, Imogen finds the strength to sit up. And then finally, to try to stand. The big step is she didn't die in the operation. The next big step is she got up, or woke up and got up, and if we can slow, we'll slowly get her eating again, and, and it, it is just tiny, tiny little steps all the way. It's a miracle that Imogen has come this far, but after major surgery on the stable floor, infection is a very real danger. If she makes it through tonight, tomorrow and then days on after that. If she gets to two weeks, then we can kind of breathe out. We'll return later to find out whether or not Imogen makes it through the hours and days ahead. But now, up in Longleat House, Kate and I are about to face a test that will try us to the limits. Every year, a quarter of a million visitors enjoy a tour of the magnificent state rooms. And it's up to the house guides to make sure they go away both enlightened and enthralled. 
If you worked in the court of Henry VIII, you didn't acquire just a few acres of land. By the time this gentleman died... It's a challenging job, but then we like a challenge. Kate and I have come up into the great house here at Longleat with guide Sarah Bartlett and head guide Claire Mound to learn how to become a guide in just one day. Now, Claire, how long have you been a guide at Longleat? I've been here for 12 years. OK, so we are going to try and <laughs> absorb 12 years' worth of information in just a day. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, we're going to start in this room, is that right? You and well, I? You and I are going to start here, yeah. and Ben and Sarah are going to go next door and try and absorb that room. OK, All right. we'll get going. So if somebody wants to be a guide at Longleat, what's the process? Well, you, you start with an interview, we see if we like each other, and then you come and you start training with other guides and you gradually absorb information, lots of reference books and lots of hands-on. So, I mean, how, how many rooms are open to the public? How many rooms do you have to get to know intimately? Well, you get to know, well, I think we usually say about a third of the house, about right. sort of 16, 17 rooms. There you are, that'll keep you going. And, I mean, looking at this room, they're just so packed full of things, and presumably the members of the public can ask you about anything. They can ask you about anything, but you would probably start by just telling them that this is the lower dining room, the family dining room. Right. Uh, a little bit about their porcelain, the portraits, and, of course, the wonderful ceilings. So we would get to the ceiling, as you say. I mean, it would be. It is, it is staggering. You can't walk into this <laughs> room without it. looking at it. So what sort of information would you give about this? Well, Lord Bass, great-grandfather, fell in love with Italy. He employs a London firm, John Dibley Chris, mm -hmm. to put in very dramatic ceilings, and they're largely copied from the Ducal Palace in Venice. Wow. So they're put in in the 1870s and the early 1880s. Yeah. So that changes the whole feel of the house. It ceases to really to be Elizabethan inside. And becomes more, uh, more, more Italian. Italian. So you said it's Lord Bath's great-grandfather, so which Marquis was, was that? the fourth Marquis. Fourth, fourth Marquis, Marquis. Yeah. OK. There's going to be an awful lot to remember. There's a lot to learn, but one or two things in each room. OK. And that'll see you through for quite a long way. All right, well, I'm <laughs> going to carry on swatting up. Um, go and see how Ben's getting on. Well, while Kate learns about the lower dining room, I'm in the breakfast, breakfast room with Sarah. Right, we've got the, the type of room, right? What, what are the sort of features in here that I need to learn about? You need to learn about the table. OK. That's the important feature. It was laid at for the opening of the house on the 1st of April 1949. So it's still the same... This is as it was laid on that date? Correct. And what's the it's significance of that? That is the date that the house opened to the general public. OK. That was because uh, Lord Bath's grandfather, Thomas... Who's in the... He's in the portrait above the fireplace, is he? That's right. He had died in 1946, and the family had had to sell vast quantities of the estate mm -hmm. to pay the death duties. OK. And the table is all original, is this? I mean, is that the original paper from the date? And That's the original... The eggshells so are the same, do you Probably. Think? <laughs> <laughs> Highly probably. OK. Yes. Um, what else in this room? I mean, the ceiling... The ceiling, the ceiling strikes me as amazing. The ceiling is 24-carat gold leaf. Is it really? I mean, there's so much to take in, isn't there? When, how, how long have you actually been, um, been guiding for? I've been guiding for four years now. Right. And, and did you used to take books home, homework, notes and things to, to, you to did study to for the next day? You did, yes. And, but as you went round the house, you sort of learnt things, and people asked you questions, which helps, because then you have to think what the answer is. Of and course. eventually you learn, you begin to learn it and know the answers. Presumably they still catch you out every now and then, do they? Every so often you get somebody who asks you something you don't know. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, I think I have a lot to learn, so let's... Th so the ceiling, mm -hmm. it's 24 karat gold, table 19... 49. 49. I really do have a lot to take in. Join us later, when we'll be put through our paces. There are five Southern White Rhino at Longleat, three youngsters and two veterans, Winston and Babs. Of them, Babs is the oldest. She recently turned 37, and for a rhino, that's a grand old age. Right from when she arrived back in 1993, Babs has always been a big character, loved for her even temper and friendly nature. So when three youngsters came from South Africa a couple of years ago, everyone hoped that Babs would take on the role of grandma to help them settle in. She didn't disappoint. 
But now the years are finally catching up with Babs. She's been suffering from arthritis and skin problems, and now Deputy Head Warden Ian Turner is quite worried about her. You're feeling old, aren't you, sweetheart? That's the trouble. And she's got tender bits by her on the skin, see? Which is where she's getting a bit... Uh, senior citizen age is coming in, I'm afraid. Gets to us old. All of us. I mean, normally, all this sort of stuff she likes. You see, she's flinching there, aren't you? And normally, you, as soon as you call her, she'll come over. And there's a couple of days where she's not even bothered to come over. And that's, all, that's the signs that keepers look for, which the vet can't see. He can see if she's looking ill, but signs of illness, but it's, it's when she's not being a normal self. She's the friendly one. But vet Duncan Williams has been called to meet keeper A.D. Lanfear to see if anything can be done for Babs. Babs, you going to come say hello? Hey. But she's eating well, isn't she? she? Oh, she's got a very good appetite. Sorry, she's it's eating lovely. It's old age as well, isn't it? It's just... Oh, there you go, darling. She doesn't look very steady at all. She looks very weak. It's when she very turns. Weak. Yeah. When she twists, she's certainly in the, in the middle of the week. She was actually collapsing. She was actually banged. She was hitting the deck. Well, Babs is looking her age, actually. She's not looking great at all. Um, this time of year, you know, it's the middle of winter, and you can see her skin is just all crusty and scabby and dry. But that's true, true to all of them. They've all got sort of skin problems, I think, which tends to go away in the spring when they start wallowing again. We're doing everything we can. We're nursing her through it, aren't we? We're looking after the best we can. We're not, you know, we're making life as comfortable as possible and supplement her, try and prevent the arthritis from becoming too serious and just keeping a close eye on her. I think her quality of life's OK. I mean, she's had a bit of a bad week or so, but um, her appetite's excellent still, so that's a pretty good indicator that, uh, you know, she's, she's, she's not too seriously ill. Come on, Babs. Come on. White rhinos have been known to reach 40 years in captivity, but few live past their mid-30s. For now, everyone is doing all they can to relieve Babs' suffering. needs nursing through the winter, it's a difficult time for him. So it needs the extra care, so yeah, we've all got a soft spot for her. But she's a big character, yeah. And that's the painkiller. Take the edge off of things for her. Well, obviously she's got her hay, which you see her eating now. And it's high fibre, high fibre nuts. And there's linseed and barley. We also give her some copper salts and some uh, vitamin extracts and some supplements. There you go, darling. But the hard truth is that Babs probably needs more than a spoonful of medicine if she's to survive the winter. If her quality of life deteriorates much more, the time will come when the vet and the keepers will have to face a difficult decision. Will it be kinder to keep her going or to put her to sleep? I think my brain's going to explode. Ben and I have spent the entire day trying to learn how to be guides here at Longleat House. There is so much to remember, I can't tell you. Um, but now it's test time. Um, I have a willing group. Please come in and uh, I shall tell you about the lower dining room. Now, I know that this looks like the most fabulously luxurious room, but actually, this was the day-to-day -day dining room. The family would have eaten dinner here every day. And just have a look at this china on the table. Every single one of these plates is unique. They're hand-painted. Um, they were bought for when George III came to visit the house in 1789. And uh, each one is absolutely unique. Um, probably not to put in a dishwasher, I wouldn't have thought. Um, the first thing you notice in this room, if you look up, is the amazing ceiling. This ceiling was put in by the fourth Marquis, that's the present Lord Bath's grandfather, and he loved Italian, the, the Italian style. And so this ceiling is actually copied from the Ducal Palace in Venice. 
So how do they clean it? Painstakingly. You know your blusher brushes? That's what they do. They'll stand up on ladders and get in so that you can get in. It's so delicate and obviously it's all gilt mm. and uh, they will get in and brush it away with literally with blusher brushes. So Lucky. it's not something you want to do too, <laughs> too often. <laughs> How often do they have to redo it, repaint it? Um, it's done roughly every 10 years or so, but because it's kept in very good condition and because it's cleaned, it's mm. kept very well. So things do stay preserved and, um, and you know, in, in this sort of magnificent state. Good job. Now, if you want to go through into this room and my colleague Ben will, will meet you in there. Thank you. What a spot. Follow me in here. Now, I would like to welcome you into the breakfast room. Please come along, everyone. Um, very impressive. Lots of paintings of various buffs along the ceilings. All sorts, in fact. Um, the table is um, laid still originally from the 1st of April, 1949, believe it or not. All totally original. The original newspaper, even the original egg that was left there at that time, and that was when the fourth Marquis, maybe the fifth, in the painting above the fireplace, uh, passed away, and there was incredible death duties that had to be paid. So the house had to open to the public so that you lucky people could come and have a look around and see what went on in here. Um, very impressive ceiling. So in terms of the painting on the ceiling, would that have been painted on the ground and then set into position on the ceiling? It would have um, very likely have been painted uh, and then put Painting up there. Position. Yes, yes, wow. absolutely. And, um, and uh, there's a door, a little hidden door just below the painting. That was, that was um, incorporated in uh, the 1820s so that the servants could um, come along and uh, lay the table and things. Any questions from anybody? Well, I hope you all enjoyed the room. Please join Sarah through this way. Thank, Thank you very you. much for coming, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. I think I did rather well. Well done, Ben. <laughs> It's been a month now since Imogen underwent an emergency caesarean. The baby was already dead, and no one really thought that Mum had much chance either. But here she is, and she's doing fine. We had hardly any infection to speak of. In fact, it was so little infection, it it's not even really worth mentioning. Um, yeah, she's just fantastic. I think uh, the kind of animal she is, she's very, very quiet, very laid back. I think that stood well in her stead because obviously the stress level from the pain and, and, and the darting and all the hassle was very low. Obviously she didn't know anything about the op because she was completely out, but stress will get them in a lot of other ways. That didn't affect her. Yeah, really, really pleased. It's unlikely that Imogen will be allowed to get pregnant again. The risks are just too high. But with her steady nature, she still has an important role to play. She's got a great future in the herd because she's going to be central to a lot of things. Unfortunately, the one thing she possibly isn't going to do is have calves of her own. But she's got two sisters here. So there are going to be offspring from that family and she can just be everybody's dear old maiden aunt being a bit dotty in the corner, I suppose. Hello, girls. Imogen has been getting a lot of visits from all the staff that helped that day. It's an experience head warden Keith Harris won't forget in a hurry. I've been involved with Jaff, well, for 30 years, ever since I've been here, but um, we, we've sedated them for you know, foot trimming and um, lameness, that, that type of um, problem, but um, never caesarean. So, um, to actually, you know, be successful as well is, is quite something. So, you know, we're, we're quietly quite chuffed. The operation, what she went through, four and a half hours under anaesthetic, and then all that fantastic. An absolute a miracle, nature. How she can recover so well. Fantastic it is. Makes her extra special now, yeah. 
to gone through all she's gone through. We thought we was going to lose her, really, and truthfully, in the bottom of our hearts, even though we are going to... You've, you've got to try these things. We thought she was going to die. in the house, it's time to find out who's won the guide's challenge, Ben or me. The judge is head guide Claire Mound, and I don't know what Ben's been up to, but I'm beginning to suspect a hint of bias. Well, I think you did brilliantly, Ben. You got your people through. You didn't lose anybody, did you? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> no one's still hidden under the and table. And you answered spontaneous questions that I think might have floored you, and you got them right. Thank you. Yeah, it's all, sounding, even, even it's all better. sounding very good. Um, what, what, about, what about Kate? Kate Kate did... Well, you did all right too, didn't you? Oh, yes, um, but you got right. the grandfathers muddled up a little I bit, did didn't you? Yes, yes, there are too yes. many grandfathers in this family. There were too uh, many yeah. Thomases and Johns <laughs> and things, but uh, you, you... It you was got, great you grandfather, got, wasn't it? It was a great grandfather. And, and uh, otherwise, yeah. no, you were getting there, but by a small whisker, I think that uh, Ben <gasps> got slightly better... And we'll give you a badge. Oh. No, it does mean we might ask so you to just unfair. work now. Oh, really? Does that mean bigger groups <laughs> bigger as well? Bigger groups, yes. I've got about uh, 30 small children waiting for oh, you no, downstairs. To wear that with... <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> and presumably, how many more rooms do I have to learn about? Oh, about 10 more, yes. yes, yes. Yeah. But, oh dear, uh, I have my work cut out for me. Do you want the badge, Kate? Bye, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> See you next year. <laughs> Sadly, that's all we've got time for on today's programme. But here's what's coming up on the next Animal Park. Up in Wolf Wood, the cubs born last year are getting big. We'll find out if they're now eating with the grown-ups. Back with the lions, Mum goes ballistic when it's time to give the youngest cub her injections. And down in Pet's Corner, we'll meet two new bouncing babies, the first otter cubs born at Longleat in over 30 years. So don't miss the next Animal Park.